Okay, TEI. The activities uh, prior to TEI were leisurely. The updates were passed up in good time. We passed our uh, sex and star check. Uh, in general, the, uh, the usual sequence of P30 and P40 is, uh, is one that's been well worked out, and TEI had uh, no surprises up until TIG time. Uh, there are a couple items in here on page 32 that should get deleted. Strip photography configuration, we didn't have that as a DTO or anything. Targets of opportunity photography, uh, well, we took a few photographs prior to TEI, but essentially we, uh, we spent the time preparing for the burn. We didn't do any television uh, prior to TEI. Uh, TEI overburn criteria, those were, those criteria were uh, ones that had been hammered out for a long time. Uh, we didn't have any argument with them. Essentially, it was a two second overburn uh, if confirmed by uh, EMS reading of minus 40 feet per second. And uh, we, uh, we came close to shutting the burn down manually. I'll get into that a little bit later. At TIG, this was the first burn with CSM only. I had my rate needles on 5.1, and uh, I do that to uh, because I, I think it's a, a good mode to be in if you're worried about uh, any sort of abnormal dynamics. They're much more readily apparent on the on the sensitive scale at TIG. Uh, I noticed uh, more rate needle activity uh, than I had seen in previous burns. I had uh, a start transient of, uh, oh, probably uh, uh, four tenths of, of a foot per second uh, activity on the rate needles in both uh, pitch and yaw. And uh, uh, with that, there was very little attitude deviation. It was just uh, a, uh, a fairly rapid uh, oscillation of both the, uh, the gimbal uh, position indicators and the rate needles, and it damped itself down, I'd say, within the first 10 or 15 seconds of the burn. In roll, the uh, vehicle uh, was dead banding. Uh, Instead of plus or minus five degrees, it appeared on my uh, attitude indicator to be more like plus or minus eight degree roll dead band, and it was uh, banging against the roll stops fairly crisply. It would cruise over and hit uh, dead band, and the jets would fire, and it would uh, go back the other way. And uh, this uh, this roll dead banding was uh, quite obvious during this burn, as opposed to the other burns. I think all these indications are normal. They were just uh, somewhat exaggerated during the first 20 seconds of the burn, especially compared to the uh, more damped case of having the limb attached. The uh, EMS counter moves out pretty swiftly, and it was difficult for me to, uh, to estimate exactly when I might have minus 40 on the counter. The, uh, the burn... Uh, the ISP of the engine must have uh, decreased or something. At any rate, the burn duration was longer than uh, predicted. And uh, when uh, burn time plus two seconds had elapsed, I thought that uh, I would have minus 40 on the EMS counter by the time uh, I could get the thing shut down. And uh, there was some doubt in my mind as to whether it was shutting itself down automatically or not. So. Uh, at burn time plus two seconds and some small fraction, I turned both the uh, EMS delta V or both uh, delta V normal switches off. And uh, I think uh, just a fraction of a second prior to this, we got a good automatic shutdown. At any rate, our residuals were very, very small. So uh, either we got a good automatic shutdown fire followed immediately by my turning the switches off, or else uh, I shut the thing down manually and was just extremely lucky in, uh, in, in that it coincided with the, the pings uh, 
residuals, but uh, for some reason uh, that, that burn duration was a little bit longer than I would have expected. LOI, you remember, was shorter than uh, than we had predicted, and uh, this was the next burn to follow uh, LOI, so I was sort of uh, uh, surprised that it did take longer than normal. The, uh, the pugs was a little bit uh, unpredictable based upon uh, performance during LOI. The fact that I couldn't catch up with the increase and it got ahead by four or five tenths, something like that, and a pre-flight briefing that that would be the case, why I left the uh, switch and increase, and uh, we lit off and got through the initial guidance and everything, and I looked at the uh, meter and it was showing down and decrease, which uh, struck me as uh, maybe not being what it ought to do. I expected it to be an increase, but I thought, well, maybe this is a characteristic of early in the burn it does this sort of thing, so I left the switch where it was to try and catch up. I guess in the meantime, uh, the, the two numbers, where one had been bigger than the other, why they had changed position. And uh, the fact that when it says increase, you, you throw it in the increase direction, uh, it, it's not at all obvious during a burn if one's a little bigger than the other and you're not sure whether the needle is believable or not, what to do. So I left it an increase and it seemed as though it was getting further apart and uh, the, the needle was staying down. So uh, contrary to what we had been led to believe, I put the thing down to decrease just to see what was going to happen. And sure enough, it stopped the divergence of the two numbers and they, we didn't have a long enough burn for it to get right to zero, but they were within two tenths. So anyway, it was a little different than what we expected, uh, and uh, I guess if you really want to play that game, you might need to write some cues or something on there so you don't misinterpret uh, anything. It worked out good. But uh, it was unusual, and that might have something to do with, uh, with the burn time. We uh, tried something uh, different on this flight. The ground uh, computed a post-burn state vector, a predicted post-burn state vector, and put it in the limb slot. So after the end of the burn, we could call up verb 83 and get an R and R dot from our state vector over to the predicted state vector that we ought to have at that point, and it came out real close, uh, seven-tenths of a mile and eight-tenths of a foot per second, indicating that uh, it's kind of another double check that uh, we really did get the, the uh, burn that, uh, that we thought we were going to get. That's uh, not really a, any kind of a requirement if everything works. It is a nice kind of thing if you have uh, uh, an SBS problem or you take over with SCS in the middle of the burn, uh, your computer is working okay, but uh, the, guidance isn't. the guidance isn't working, then you can uh, use that vector in your hip pocket to find out uh, how good of a, a uh, switchover you did and how close your SCS burn came out to where you ought to be. It's nice to know kind of thing. It's what we need for TLI. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Trans-Earth Coast. Uh, Systems verification for coast. Well, all the systems were go. There wasn't anything to do. Nav, nav sightings, and optics. Uh, we didn't do any uh, onboard navigation. Uh, our uh, flight plan called for doing it only in the event of comm failures. Uh, the optics worked normally on the way home. Evaporators. Uh, we did not activate any uh, either the primary or the secondary evaporator until just prior to entry. So during trans. Uh, Earth Coast, those were not in the system. Passive thermal control, three modes. We didn't have three modes, we just had the one mode. We always rolled uh, GNN control at three tenths of a degree per second. Uh, that procedure we've already talked about, there were no differences uh, trans Earth, although uh, uh, the, the geometry, of course, of the vehicles was a lot different, and I thought that probably. Uh, it, command module by itself would go uh, unstable quicker. Uh, Neil thought it would not, and uh, he was right. Uh, 
It was very stable on the way back, just like it was on the way out. The LMP would have preferred pointing north. However, there was a, an added advantage in that we got to look at the Magellanic Clouds by uh, PTC and 270. <laughs> but to look at the Earth, to look at north, you had to get upside down. Yeah, we went out in 090 pitch angle and came back 270 pitch angle. Uh, it smocks next to me. I don't care one way or the other. Excessive moisture on tunnel hatch area. There was a little tiny bit of moisture up in there at various uh, times. Uh, uh, on the way home, there was less than there had been earlier. The last time I checked was at 100 and 80 hours or thereabouts, and it was... You thought it was uh, less, sir? I don't remember yeah, much moisture was, at all. Uh, I thought it was more on the way home. Yeah, I did I too. We well, made use of the uh, ECS hoses. Yeah, I stuck put the them hoses up, up there, and uh, there's one comment in here. Uh, I'll find it. Here it is. Uh, 180 hours, dry as a bone. That was okay. after we put the hoses up there. Yeah, it was after we put the hoses. Now, prior to that... Uh, there, there was a little bit of moisture up there, and I did wipe it off with a towel sometime after TEI. I could go into the tunnel usually and wipe my finger around around the hatch up there and come back with a wet finger. But you can see just little beads of moisture, like uh, like a on a beer bottle or something nice like that. It wasn't uh, there weren't great globs of moisture, and as I say, at 180 hours. Uh, it was uh, dry as a bone when we came to this entry, wipe excessive moisture from tunnel hatch area. Now, that leads me to believe that probably it has something to do with the routing of those hoses, that if you really cram a, a set of hoses up in that tunnel as far up as they'll go and sort of wedge the hoses up uh, around the uh, side of the hatch there as far as you can, that it might help in uh, keeping a circulation pattern up in there that would, would keep it fairly dry. We uh, shot up a batch of film right after TEI. We uh, pitched down and picked up good attitude to uh, photograph the moon out of uh, the hatch window and uh, yeah, we took a whole lot of what I think are ought to be real good pictures. Made a lot of color comparison checks. Tried to decide what color. And a lot of nice was. arguments about the backside. Uh, well, we haven't mentioned anything uh, yet about the, the color as viewed particularly, and I guess one thing, uh, if people are going to be listening to these or looking at them before they debrief, is I think that it makes some difference which window you're looking out, because the windows uh, do seem to have a little bit of a coating on it, and I got the distinct impression that... Uh, it depended on how you looked out of a particular window, what angle you looked out of it. Uh, to tell you uh, just what kind of color you were going to see on the surface. It, it didn't look the same out of each window. So that could answer a lot of questions about uh, the differences that people see. I'm not sure that I'm sure that not every spacecraft has the same coatings on the windows. I don't know how significant it is, so. Okay, fuel cell purging was normal on the way back. Uh, consumables, uh, we finally, we almost caught our RCS budget. Last hack on it was we were 1% down. And on the hydrogen and on the oxygen, we were very close to nominal. Whoever figured those out did a good job. SPS uh, mid-course corrections, uh, none were required on the way back. We did have one... Uh, mid-course of 4.8 feet per second, which we did with the RCS. Uh, lunar landmarks, mid-course, that's not applicable. Star to Earth horizon, not applicable. ECS redundancy, we did not investigate any of the redundant systems with ECS. DAP loads uh, were as called out in the flight plan. I don't have any comment on those. We, uh, we widened up the DAP dead band uh, in PTC to 30 degrees. Uh, which uh, is really uh, sort of a waste of time uh, in that DAP PTC procedure because uh, as soon as you widen up the dead band, you turn all uh, 12 of 
or 16 of your RCS thrust switch is off, so it doesn't really matter whether the dead band is wide or narrow, uh, the thing is incapable of firing any thrusters anyhow. <laughs> Do you? Nice to hear what they were saying.